If you're ready, I'm ready, Angie. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, okay. Well, this is Angie um, and I am Jay Keck and I'll be teaching about spring birds today. And uh, we work for South Carolina Wildlife Federation. Um, our, this year is our 90th anniversary. Uh, we're having a, a 90th birthday party later on um, and uh, started by hunters and fishermen and uh, kind of morphed into a company that's all encompassing. So we're an organization that is. And, uh, you know, we, we have people that are birders, you know, spider lovers. We have snake classes, oyster classes, bug classes, all sorts of classes about wildlife and conservation. Uh, in hopes, you know, of getting y'all hooked to, uh, to nature and, and when you fall in love with something, you start caring for it. So um, hopefully you'll, you'll love all the classes that we have. If you haven't seen them all or, or want to learn more about them, just go to our YouTube page. All of them are posted there. And uh, this one will also be posted there. Angie will put it up later. Um, if you want to kind of revisit some things about this, uh, about this talk today. Um, anything you want to add, Angie, or you want me to go ahead and get started? Let's go. All right. Well, again, Angie's going to be looking at those questions coming in um, and she'll just kind of pop in from time to time and uh, ask me those questions. So if I don't get to them, um, I'll get to them after the class. And if I don't get to them, then um, just uh, reach out to me um, by phone or by email and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. So uh, yeah, we'll just kind of, I'm going to, we're going to talk about um, identification um, uh, visually and then by ear today, uh, where to find some of these birds uh, in the trees, uh, where they like to be in the canopy or on the ground, um, and where in the, the southeast or in the Carolinas you can, you can find these birds. Um, and so I'm just going to start it with, with this sound right here, and it's of, of the common yellow throat. And I want you all to go ahead and practice using that chat box um, and just answer that question. And y'all have plenty of time to cheat and look in, uh, look on the internet to see where what they like. But where are you likely to find common yellow throat warblers? Um, is it A, you know, kind of the wet areas? Uh, B, mature forests, or C, dry prairie land? So y'all pop in your answers. Make sure it's going to all panelists and attendees. Um, and uh, Angie, you let me know what what kind of answers are coming in if you can. A, B, and C. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. <laughs> Where are everybody? So yeah, it's pretty. Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give y'all a hint. You know, when, when you read about this bird, sometimes you'll you'll find uh, things that that predate that that eat. You know, these these birds. And one of the one of the predators of this bird um, is 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 a largemouth bass. Uh, they've they've found you know many many of these common yellow throated warblers uh, you know in the in the stomachs of of largemouth bass so you know that kind of tells you they 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 like uh, wet areas I've never seen a lure that you know mimicked a, a common yellow throated warbler so uh, but uh, you know it it happens um, and when I think of Lake Murray that's where I grew up I, I think about you know the shoreline being cleared out and I bet back in the day you know uh, before it had so many people clearing all, all the shoreline and shoreline and moving in it was probably covered with with yellow throated warblers um, so common yellow or sorry not yellow throated warblers common yellow throats um, but it's a it's a bird that loves you know kind of marshy areas um, you know it's not going to be in you know the typically the the middle of a forest um, even if it is wet uh, you find them on edges you find them in prairie areas that are wet uh, not dry prairie lands um, so you know if, if you have a, a water you know Saluda Shoals is a good example um, there's a, a, a power line right away and it has a depression and it holds a lot of water there's cattails um, and it's and it's really shrubby, um, and you find a lot of common common yellow throated warblers there. So yeah, wet areas. And uh, when you start learning the the habitat um, that these birds like, you're going to find a lot of these birds. Sorry about that. Um, and let's go ahead and listen to the to the song of the common yellow throat. And it kind of has a rolling witchity 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 call. But, you know, it can switch it up like that too, right? Um, so we're going to talk about that, um, how these birds have kind of a, a foundation call or a song rather. Um, and then we're going to talk about some of the other ones that they have that might not be what you expect. So I want to talk, I want to help you all see more birds this year. Um, man, birds are just so fascinating. They're beautiful. Um, they add so much joy to my life and excitement. I want you all to find as many birds as possible this spring. And they're here. 
you know, in, in the uh, in the yard this morning, I just stepped out for 15 minutes, heard ye uh, yellow rumped warbler singing and saw them in their breeding plumage, which which they're really stunning. Uh, I didn't see it, but I heard a black and white warbler singing, uh, northern perula singing, um, and even had a blue headed vireo that was singing and we'll play some of those songs, uh, you know, throughout this presentation. Uh, but one of the birds that I remember studying its, its song and then finding it that spring was this beautiful black throated green warbler. Um, and look, look here, we, we use these things called mnemonics to help us remember what these, what these songs sound like. And so you can see this one, black throated green warbler says trees, trees, murmuring trees. So if you can remember that, a lot of times you'll, you'll, you'll find that bird through its song. So uh, I, I have this silly saying, you won't see what you don't see, right? But you might see what you hear. So if I'm looking over here and there's a bird that's, that's singing, you know, 150 yards this way that I recognize by ear, but I haven't seen, I can go focus my, my time and efforts on, on trying to find that bird. So you always have a really good shot if, if you know what you're, what you're listening to. Um, and even if you don't know what it is and it's something different, go find out. It might be something really neat. Um, so let's see if you can hear the trees, trees, murmuring trees. So trees, trees, murmuring trees. And then that, that second call is another one that it does. Um, and I've heard both. Um, we have these pushing through South Carolina, um, but typically if you wanna see them on their breeding grounds, you have to go up to the mountains. Um, and they are, you know, if you're, you're in the right area, they can be very, very common. So uh, learn, those, learn those songs learn those sounds and you'll be able to find this bird. And so the next bird that we're gonna talk about is the oven bird. And so you can see it says, it's screaming teacher, teacher here. And you know, this one's kind of a stretch for me. Um, the way I, I like to remember this, this song is just it's crescendo uh, re repetitive call and it's super clear. Um, and I think once you study it, uh, you'll, you'll totally be fine and you'll, you'll find this bird this year. See how it kind of gets, it gets louder. You know, a Carolina wren, which does sound similar, is going to stay flat. Um, a Kentucky warbler, which is a, a kind of similar again. Um, it's, it's not as cr crisp. It's not as clear as this one. I'm going to play it one more time. Um, so I don't know if you can hear teacher there. I, I really can't. Uh, but you know, it's, it's that crescendoing repetitive, uh, kind of what a, a, a two note song there. And that one, if you're in the Midlands, you know, Harbison State Forest is a, is a great place to, to visit, to see that bird. Um, but that one's going to be seen if you, if you have some woods, you know, next to your house, you can see that one, uh, during migration, uh, even if you're not, not visiting a park that, you know, at, at that time. Um, one that we I typically don't talk about too too much just because it's really rare um, during migration is the cerulean warbler, gorgeous gorgeous bird. Um, but you know, try make a road trip this year. Go up to the Blue Ridge Mountains, uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway. They have all all those overlooks that you can park at. Um, they're great places to to find birds. You can find. Uh, not only the cerulean warbler um, on, on certain ones, but black burnian warblers, indigo buntings, um, uh, the black throated green warbler that we just that we just talked about. Uh, it's a really neat way to bird, and y'all y'all stay tuned. We we might have a have a class up there this 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 year, a guided tour up there. Um, and we're just trying to figure out how to do it, you know, safely. Uh, so. You know, I want y'all to connect with this bird. Um, it's in steep, steep decline. It's it's losing a lot of its uh, uh, wintering habitat um, in in South America, uh, Colombia. Um, it's declined about seventy two percent in the last um, fifty years. So you know, connect with this bird. Um, try to fall in love with this thing so you take care of it. Um, and it, you know, it's providing habitat where it breeds uh, here in the United States, but it's also protecting those places down in South America. Um, where this where this beautiful uh, bird winters. But see if you can hear burr burr. I'm gonna sneeze. Um, we we went up to the mountains last year. Uh, just a, just a, a few of us. Um, I wanted to see this bird. I'd never seen it before and practiced the the sound. And it was probably the second stop that we had at an overlook and, and we found it. So here, see if you can hear burr burr burr. I'm gonna sneeze. It's fast.
So burr, 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 I'm going to sneeze. Um, and that bird, you know, again, you're not going to see it too, too often around here. But once you go to the to the mountains on those higher elevations, especially around some steep slopes um, and mature, mature forests, uh, you have a really good shot of finding that bird. But learn its learn its uh, uh, song. Um, and always, I like to, you know, put put pictures of bird food on on all the presentations that I'm doing anymore. So, you know, this beautiful Palamedes caterpillar, uh, this beautiful Cecropia moth caterpillar. That is bird food, and that's what these birds need during migration and while they're while they're breeding and, and reproducing. Um, if you've never seen a cerulean warbler and want to uh, find one, um, you have a good shot again this year of doing so. Um, go on eBird, uh, just type in cerulean warbler. Uh, you, it's going to pop up a lot of places in North Carolina. But if you go to this place uh, on this link right here, or just Google um, North Carolina Audubon uh, cerulean warbler or Bull Creek. Um, IBA, which stands for Important Birding Area, uh, you'll get you'll you'll find this this link. You'll you'll get to this place eventually, um, and it has great information. Has maps, has trails uh, where you can find the cerulean warbler. So uh, if if you haven't seen it, go on an adventure in the mountains this year and see see uh, the cerulean. Um, while you're at it. Uh, go find the, one of my favorite warblers, the, the Canada, um, and just, just this beautiful yellow, yellow bird with the, uh, that, that gorgeous black necklace. Uh, one of my favorite things about this bird is that gorgeous eye ring that it has. Um, but it's another bird of the Blue Ridge Parkway. It likes those uh, mature forests as well, but it also likes, um, well, I have it here, the, the cool and moist uh, understories, uh, dense, well-established shrub understory. Um, where you find the cerulean warbler, warbler you're probably not going to find the Canada, um, but that just adds to the adventure. It adds to the places that you can go um, explore up there. And then I have a rosy maple moth here. One of the, one of the foods that, that these guys like to eat besides caterpillars are actual moths and butterflies. Um, and when you're trying to uh, practice this song of the Canada warbler, um, try to listen for this, this uh, quick chip note at the beginning. Um, there's really no mnemonic that I've come up with or that I've read to help us remember the, the song of this bird. Um, it's just one of those things where you just have to repeat and, and practice and uh, you'll, you'll be able to find this bird too. It, has to, it, it happens really quick. It has that quick chip and then it kind of goes into its song. I'm going to play that one more time, see if you can hear it. And there was a, a white-throated sparrow that was singing in the background too. But gorgeous bird. Um, I, I hope you all make a trip up to the mountains and, and see it. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of go over a couple more songs that are just kind of a jumbled mess. Um, you know, they don't uh, have any, any kind of uh, real pattern to them. Uh, they're kind of hard to memorize, you know. Um, I, I really, uh, having a phrase really helps me mem memorize, um, you know, a song. And when I don't have that, uh, you know, it takes me a little bit longer. And it, it took me a little while to, to remember these and to learn these. Um, but let's listen to the American Red Start. So I'm not going to keep on playing that one. Um, I think it's about 40 seconds long, but uh, it, it has a lot of different um, songs, a lot of variation to it. So that's the that's one that you just have to kind of practice. Um, sometimes it's going to fake you out. It's faked me out plenty of times. Um, and and don't feel bad if you get it wrong. Uh, one of the best birders and I in the, one of the best birders in the southeast and I went to the mountains last year. And he thought this one bird singing was a yellow rumped warbler. I thought it was, I can't remember what I thought it was. Um, I thought it was a, a different kind of warbler and it ended up turning, uh, uh, it, it ended up being a chestnut sided warbler. So it faked both of us out. Um, you're gonna get them wrong sometimes. Sometimes they don't do what we expect, right? Um, and here's a magnolia warbler. And that sounded kind of like a hooded warbler there. 
Um, but nice, nice and short. Um, and this one's going to be kind of low to mid canopy. Um, this book right here, I think I have it referenced here, the, the Warbler Guide. Uh, that's the book. Um, it's one of the best books out there. Um, and it'll, it'll actually tell you where, you know, the birds, where, where these warblers, I think we have around 56, 57 warblers that come up to the United States to breed, uh, where they can be found in the canopy. So you, I don't know if you can see it or not, but this one, uh, I have the American Red Star pulled up. So it shows that it can go to mid, mid canopy to the lower canopy and even in bushes and, and you know, some pretty, pretty close to the ground. So you don't have to strain your neck too, too high to see, you know, these birds right here. But same, same goes with the, uh, the magnolia. A lot of times, um, I, I usually see those in the fall. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen one in the, in the springtime here in, in Chapin where I live, but always see them in the fall every single year. Uh, one of the most common migratory birds that, that we get here. Um, and they are usually eye level to, I mean, maybe up to 20 ish feet in the in the tree. So uh, the book will tell you where to look in the trees and it's almost always, always uh, correct whenever you're out there in the field. So what is an American red star, you know? Uh, we've got the Magnolia Warbler here. Uh, we have an American red star here. So y'all, what is an American red star? Is it an Oriole? You know, it's black and orange. Is it a Vireo or is it a Warbler? Um, and I don't know if you can let me know, but I, I'm kind of curious what, what people are saying about this bird. Oh, we have lots of C's. Man, everybody is getting it right. Well, that's good. <laughs> All right. Well, good, good, good. Um, I didn't know if the orange and black would, would throw people off, but y'all are pros. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a really frantic bird, um, you, you know, around Lexington, uh, where I live in Lexington County, 14 mile creek along that creek. Uh, it, there's a great path. Uh, I see them all the time down there. Um, you know, here in Chapin, uh, on my three acres, we get them every single year in the, in the spring and the fall. Uh, just go to edges, um, you know, where the forest meets, meets uh, kind of open areas, um, and, and you have a really good chance of seeing that bird. Uh, in the springtime, you know, I, I typically don't, well, I've never seen the Magnolia Warbler. I know there's places where people get them. Um, I actually, now that I think about it, I probably saw one in, in, at Clemson, uh, the Botanical Garden there. So uh, certain places you can find them. Um, they just seem to evade me here in the Midlands. Uh, but great, great birds. Um, and if you haven't seen them, learn those, learn those sounds and learn the habitat that they like, and then go find that bird this year. And let's see, little Jay in Lexington never can remember these, uh, these songs here. So I'm going to play them just for him. Uh, cause each year he forgets, but you know, this today I walked out and I was really excited because I heard a blue headed Vireo singing. Uh, it's one of the most delicate songs uh, that, that's out there right now. It's super clear. It's kind of quiet. I always uh, kind of describe it as a bird, like a shy bird. Um, you know, out of these three vireos, um, it's, it's what I would consider the, the, the shyest or the quietest of, uh, of the three. Um, but it has a beautiful crystal clear song, really delicate. And, um, you know, I, I heard it and I, I found it in a post oak um one of our post oak uh trees in the in the backyard and and was able to get a really good look at it before it it heads up north to to breed so again it, it kind of sounds shy right it, you know i've got this this saying right here where are you here i am way up high in a tree so it goes where are you here i am way up high in a tree. So kind, kind of quiet, kind of shy, but then you have something like the yellow-throated vireo. It's a lot more confident sounding, right? It's, it's really raspy, um, a, little bit, a little bit faster, right? And that's a bird, again, we, we could have all three vireos and, and maybe even a fourth, a wide-eyed vireo in, in our yards at, at one time this, this time of year. Again, the blue-headed vireo will be going up, up north to breed. The, the furthest south that we'll probably find it breeding is the Blue Ridge Parkway. So there's a lot of birds up there if you've never birded there. It's really cool, um, especially to, to hear some of the birds that we don't get to, to hear 
uh, in, in most of the parts of South Carolina. So get up to the mountains and explore this year. But the yellow-throated vireo is a lot, a lot raspier, a lot burrier, um, and a little bit uh, louder and a little bit, little bit quicker. But then you have a red-eyed vireo. And I always, I always kind of describe this one as having way too much coffee. Uh, doesn't lack confidence, and it just uh, sings incessantly. So even when it's 98 degrees out there, you know, in July, it'll, you'll hear this bird singing. And I know one one was uh, studied um, while it was while it was singing. And I think in a day it sang. I, I want to say it was around ten thousand times. So it's a it's a it's a song monster. It just continues to sing and sing and sing and sing. And then you have this beautiful viceroy caterpillar. Remember bird food, and that was taken from uh, from our yard. And it mimics uh, bird droppings, uh, you know, to help protect it. But I'm sure quite a few of them are, are nabbed by, by hungry birds, especially during migration. Um, so let's practice some of the vocal uh, brown birds that we have. Um, and one of my favorites, the yellow-billed cuckoo, uh, I haven't seen any reports of that, but that bird's gonna be showing up pretty soon. So learn the, learn the song, learn the call, and you'll be able to find this bird. And I don't know if you've ever heard it described as the, the rain crow, um, but the, I guess the, the old saying is that whenever this bird would, would sing or call, you know, it was, it, it was about to rain. Um, I don't know if there's any truth to that, but uh, that's what they say. So here's a worm eating warbler, beautiful bird, even though it doesn't have these bright, bright colors that a lot of these other warblers have. Beautiful bird and it has a really neat, neat song. Almost almost sounds like a bug, like an insect. And that song can be confused with the chipping sparrow. Typically the chipping sparrow is not gonna pulse as, um, as quickly. It's not gonna, not gonna last as long, uh, but that worm eating warbler is pretty darn fast. Um, but I have played the worm eating warbler song before and attracted uh, chipping sparrows to where I was. So. Um, you know, they're, they're pretty similar, but uh, I've found this bird every single year in my yard, the last, you know, three or four spring migrations because it, it sings and because I practiced it and I learned it. So um, if you have a nice, nice uh, thick area or, or wooded area um, that, that meets your yard, you have a good chance of seeing that bird. And that's not one that, that spends a ton of time way up in the canopy. That's more of a, of a middle canopy to, to lower canopy type of bird. So you can really get some good looks at that. Yes, ma'am. Hey, yeah, we have a few questions. Um, Christine wants to know what are the best apps to identify all types of animals? Well, iNaturalist is great. Um, and I think they have another one called Seek, S-E-E-K. Um, I think it's owned by iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is a wonderful one. Um, now it's not gonna, it, it helps you identify plants and, and animals that you can take a picture of. So um, if you can nab some pictures of birds and, and pop it on there, it'll give you some suggestions. And most of the time it's, it's, it's dead on. Um, Merlin Bird ID, and I'll talk about these you know, later on. Merlin Bird ID is, is my, one of my favorite apps. Um, uh, National Audubon Society has a great app out there. Um, and they have a good website where you can practice these sounds, um, allaboutbirds.org. And I have all this stuff written down at the end. So we'll get to it in a little bit. Um, but and we'll I, share that. Yeah, yeah, we'll share that with everybody too in the um, a follow up email. So you'll have the uh, hyperlinks. Um, another question Kathy asked um, What is the best field guide for beginning birders? I really do think um, just a field guide on your phone, uh, Merlin Bird ID. The, the really cool thing about that, you know, a book, a book doesn't sing. <laughs> I can't press a button and make this, you know, give me a sound, but your phone can. So uh, Merlin Bird ID, uh, you know, again, Audubon, I'm sure has one that, that has sounds on it. Um, and uh, allaboutbirds.org, even though you're not going to take your computer out there, your phone, um, as long as you have a signal, you can access, you know, all about birds and 
it, you could you could type a bird in and if it's not that one it, it'll give you some uh ones that are similar to it so um you can use that and even merlin bird id you know it, it does the same so you can you can put in what what day it is um where you are uh the location and what the bird looks like um and even the habitat that you're in and it'll give you sometimes up to 15 you know uh uh, suggestions or, or options. Um, and, and most of the time, the bird that you're looking at or describing is, is going to be on that list. We have one more question about um, from Jean. She wants to know what's the best time of day to see the most birds? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so I love getting out at around seven o'clock in the morning, um, if you can, and bird until 10. And, you know, oftentimes I'm birding, you know, when, when I'm really going out um, till 12 or one, but seven to 10, I would say are, are the best hours, is the best time to go, to go birding. Um, the, the birds are waking up, they're hungry, just like you and I are, and they're wanting to find food. So um, 7 a.m., uh, I wouldn't get out, or, or especially in, in the next 30, 40 days, if I'm going, I'm, I'm wanting to get out there at seven o'clock in the morning. That's great, thanks. Um, I, asked the, I asked a lot of, uh, I'm sorry, in the chat box, I asked everyone you know, what they're seeing in their yard. So um, we've got everything from barred owls, cardinals, chickadees, house sparrows, indigo buntings, hummingbirds, blue jays, mockingbirds and robins and let's see pileated woodpecker red-bellied woodpecker wrens titmice, tufted titmice yellow rumped warblers yeah yeah well and and you know the the conversation i had with the with the woman today about the pine siskins at the feeders um you know she was kind of she was kind of uh, disappointed that i told her to take the feeders down or you know to keep them down for at least a couple of weeks um, but I told her, I said, you know, get it, get a good pair of binoculars and you're going to see way more, you know, species than you would if you're just looking at your feeders, you know, you're going to really limit yourself um, in terms of species, you know, that you see just watching your feeders. So I think, you know, taking the feeders down might be a nice little blessing and open your eyes up to the, the variety when you started just naming everything. It's just like, wow, there's a lot of bird, you know, bird varieties out there. And, and even in the, in our yard in, in three acres in, in Chapin, we've, we've got up, uh, I think we're at 107 different species. Um, but in South Carolina, you know, we're over 400, um, you know, as, as a state. So, we have a lot of birds, not just the, the 15 or 20, 25 that you might be seeing at your feeders. You have a lot more birds than, than, than what you know, or maybe, you know, perhaps um, in, your, in your yard or on your property. Um, so I appreciate that, Angie. Good questions, y'all. Um, and I think somebody said a mockingbird earlier, which is one of our, um, you know, mimic, mimic birds. Uh, and then we have the brown thrasher, which is a mimic. And then we have the great cat bird. So um, the only one I'm going to play today is the brown thrasher. You know, I like to call it the roadrunner of South Carolina. Um, but it's a it's a great predator. Um, eats eats all sorts of things, uh, and you can find it digging through through leaf litter. So it's another good reason to leave your leaves on the ground. So you provide you know all all sorts of habitat for for insects and other critters to to live in for for these birds and for other wildlife. But let's listen to the brown thrasher. It usually sings in couplets, so it usually sings in twos. Uh, the mockingbird, you know, can sing three, four, five, uh, or repeat uh, the same the same phrase or the same note three, four, five times, and then the the gray catbird just kind of goes bananas and and just repeats and repeats and repeats. So let's listen to the brown thrasher. See how it repeats it twice. It's it's really neat. So a lot of times, even when you when you can't even see it, it's it's 200 yards that way. Um, you can still identify it because it's repeating. You know these these phrases uh, twice. Almost always works. Um, and then again, another another beautiful um, caterpillar. Probably there's a few datanas out there. Probably a, a spotted datana. But you can see that that's on a. I'm pretty sure that's a red oak um, in on our property. So we have a veery right here, we have a wood thrush, and then we have a hermit thrush over here. Um, so you can find veery 
and hermit thrush um, in the mountains. Uh, I, you know, maybe maybe in South Carolina, but definitely once you get to North Carolina, um, they have little pockets where they're breeding. So if you've never heard those birds uh, sing before, um, you know, uh, again, I, I suggest heading up there and exploring the, the mountains and, and see if you can get these birds um, while they're singing. Um, you can get them here uh, during migration in, in South Carolina, uh, but they will but they will go further north to breed. Um, so the Viri, I'm not going to play its song, but it has this gorgeous, gorgeous song. Um, and in North Carolina, mid to high elevations, uh, try to find it there. But it has this beautiful uh, cinnamon uh, coloration. Uh, it's a little bit, you know, uh, I guess I would say warmer than a wood thrush, definitely warmer than a hermit thrush. Um, a little bit more slender, and you can see that these spots don't don't go don't definitely don't cover the the belly, and they also have that kind of warm cinnamon color. Not much of an eye ring. You can see the the spots the spotting on the hermit thrush is a lot darker. Um, kind of goes down a little bit further, and it has this huge pot belly. Uh, what you'll see the hermit thrush do too a lot of times is is kind of flick this tail up and down, uh, keep it at that. Uh, kind of a, a, a notch there, um, and, it, and it has a different color um, tail than the rest of its body up, up top. So it does have that warmer kind of cinnamon uh, rufusy color here, as opposed to this, this brown here. So it, it behaves a little bit differently than the Viri um, and the wood thrush, but the wood thrush is just, just really big. Um, it looks like my mom got a hold of it um, and, and Clorox bleached this right here. Um, boy, she could, she could just take my socks back in the day and, and turn those dirty things uh, white. But it looked like my mom got a hold of this, uh, the wood thrush and uh, bleached it. And it's, it's super, super white here, but it has these beautiful spots that go all the way from, the, from right below the throat down to, the, to where the, the, you can see where the legs are meeting here. So uh, a lot more extensive, extensive spotting. The eye ring is absolutely gorgeous. This picture doesn't do it j justice, but really bright white eye ring. Um, a lot, a lot more prominent than the uh, the eye ring of the hermit thrush, and this is one that we can we can uh, it, it breeds right here in South Carolina. Um, I'm pretty throughout, pretty sure throughout the entire state, um, and it's a gorgeous, gorgeous song. And I'm going to play that right here. So we'll be hearing that bird pretty soon. You know, these these birds are, are neotropical migrants. This this bird um, goes to the tropics um, and and winters down there. You know, we we think of birds you know that are that are very bright um, in coloration. Um, you know, the as being the ones that are down in the tropics. But but even the the brown and white birds, uh, some of them go down there um, for during the winter months. Um, but this one goes uh, or comes to South Carolina to breed. Um, look for them in mature forest. Uh, you know, typically you're not going to find them in mature forest with, you know, no, a, a, a perfectly clear understory. Uh, they do want some cover uh, typically. Um, so if you kind of have some, some bushes spotted uh, in, the, in the woods near, near you, you, you probably have a good shot of seeing a wood thrush. Um, and here, here are a couple of those um, sites again. So allaboutbirds.org great place to learn where the birds are or what habitat they like. Um, you can practice their sounds um, and then all of a sudden you have all this information and it works. You, you learn what where they are in the state, you learn um, the habitat that they like, the sounds, and then all of a sudden you can go out and find one. Um, it, it works every single time. Uh, let's see. And then Merlin Bird ID. If you don't have it on your phone, get it on your phone and it'll help you be a better birder this year. So uh, some, some really cool birds that we have here in South Carolina. And uh, you know, I, I just went up to Sparkleberry Swamp because we're gonna do a couple paddles uh, later on, uh, one in April and then another in May. I went there yesterday just to make sure the, the landing was easy to find and everything and it was. Um, but I just was riding down to the, to the um, parking lot with my windows down and I heard this beautiful Swainson's warbler. Um, it's song, I, I heard a, a hooded warbler and I heard the prothonotary warbler. So I'm going to play all three of those. So if you've never been to Sparkleberry and you got a kayak, I would suggest going out there. Just make sure you know how to get back to the landing. Um, but if you, if that kind of scares you, you can go with us uh, next time we offer a class there. So I'm going to start off with a Swainson's warbler, which uh, surprised me whenever I was riding down the down the dirt road with the windows down. It was nice to hear this one. 
So see if you can hear that. So, so, so sweet to hear. It works. Um, this one, the hooded warbler, you just kind of got, you have to get used to it. It's, it's to eat, to eat, to you a lot of times, but it has a few different, different uh, uh, varieties, I guess. And that was an oven, oven bird in the background. I don't know if you heard that, but it was a crescendoing teacher, 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 teacher song. All right, so remember that one and let's go back to this, this Magnolia Warbler. All right, they're pretty similar, right? And I'm gonna play this one again. So very similar. So you're not gonna get them right every single time. I don't get them right every single time. And, and again, birders that are, that are better than I am don't get them right every single time. So if you're out in a group, don't be afraid to get it wrong. It's okay. You'll, you'll survive. Um, and uh, if somebody heckles you, it's okay. You will be better for it. Um, and here's the prothonotary warbler. So the song sounds the same, you know, pretty much every time I've, I've been back in South Carolina for six years. And for the last six years, they've, they've all sounded like this. So really easy. Sweet, 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 sweet. So if you're down around the coast, uh, you know, Call Call um, Interpretive Center, I think is what it's called, but Call Call Plantation um, down there, I think off of 17. Fantastic place. They offer um, bird walks as well. Um, with, with COVID, I, I'm, I'm not sure if they're still doing it, but just call them. Uh, but they have nice clear paths. We put up um, plenty of boxes with them. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they also have natural natural cavities and, and plenty of snags there that will hold prothonotary warbler. So if you haven't seen that bird and you're at the coast, Call Call is a great place. Santee National Wildlife Refuge, um, Sparkleberry Swamp. It's kind of like the southern portion of the Midlands, but I, I put it in the, the the lower state, anyways. But Sparkleberry is a great place. Um, if you're in the Midlands and haven't seen um, well any of these birds. Um, you know, Congaree Creek Heritage Preserve, Nash, or Congaree National Park, Saluda Shoals, you have an opportunity to, to see all three of these spe species. The same with the, the places that I mentioned earlier for the lower state. And then the upper state, um, Lake Conesty would be a really great place to, to visit if you've never been, um, but you should be able to find all three of these birds there. Um, if, you, if you practice, but they have great habitat. Um, these guys, the Swainson's Warblers, they like thick areas. Um, and yeah, they, they just like thick areas. It can be, you know, thick understory, sometimes at edges. I've seen them on the sides of trails with a, with a bunch of actually Chinese privet, uh, a, a plant that we don't like at all. Um, but it, it provides kind of nice habitat for the Swainson's warbler, although it's a problem, you know, to the entire ecosystem. Um, and then hooded, hooded warblers like kind of like, uh, yeah, hot, humid, um, kind of wet areas. Uh, just kind of think about a, a forest that might have a creek running through it. Um, nice big trees, but then it kind of has some shrubs, you know, uh, here and there. Uh, again, wet, um, and you have a good chance of finding a, a hooded warbler. And then the prothonotary warbler, like still water um, or a lake um, or a floodplain that has, or a pond even, that has a lot of trees around, a lot of mature forest around it, around 250 acres at least for it to um, have appropriate breeding habitat. Yes, ma'am. So speaking of prothonotary warblers, what is the best, Katie wants to know what's the best location uh, for their, to put their boxes? Yeah, so you can put it right there in the water um, if it's safe to do so. Um, just make sure it's around four feet above the highest water level. Um, uh, but they'll they'll breed, you know, they'll use uh, uh, cavities, you know, 12, 15, you know, feet or more above, you know, the water. Um, so if it's in the water, just have it facing uh, the land. And if you have it on land, make sure it's facing the water. Um, and just, if you do put it on land, don't put it any further than 15 or 20 feet from the water. Um, you know, otherwise they, they typically don't use them. I never say never, but try to keep them very close to the water. 
Uh, again, on land, you want them facing the water. On in the water, you want them. You want the hole facing the the land. Uh, but if you don't have any forest around your body of water, you're probably not going to get them. They they want about seventy to eighty percent canopy cover, um, so shade. Okay. Um, Brigitte wants to know if we can see any of the birds that you mentioned that you can see in North Carolina or in the Blue Ridge now. Can you see some of those birds at the high? Uh, at higher elevations in South Carolina and the upstate area? You can try, um, you, you know, uh, you, you just never know what you're gonna get. Um, now you can see a lot of these birds just, just migrating through, but we're only gonna see them for a couple weeks. Um, you know, the ones that I'm talking about, you know, you're, that you're able to see like this Canada warbler um, in June or July, um, they're actually breeding up there, but you're not gonna see them here in the, in the coastal, in coastal South Carolina or in the Piedmont probably uh, during those months. You're only gonna see them for a couple weeks during migration, um, but these will be in either high elevations in South Carolina, um, but definitely in the higher elevations of North Carolina. One thing that you can use to help you with this, um, and we'll talk about that a, a little bit later, is eBird. Um, so you can, again, plug in what species that you wanna find or just an area that you wanna find and see when they have the cerulean warbler or the, the, these other birds uh, in that area. If you see that they're seeing the bird in June and July, probably means they, they have a breeding population there. So, we had a um, question from Scott about the Canada warbler. Um, the, the one photograph doesn't have the necklace on it. Is that, why is that? Uh, so that's, yeah, I should, I should have mentioned that. So that's either a female or a, or an immature male. Okay. Yep. Right. So it's, it's kind of tough to tell the two apart unless you have them in your hand and you can, you can sex them like that. So it's either a, it's either an immature male or a, or a female. Okay. And um, with hermit thrushes, we have a question from Alice. She wanted to know if they're called that because they like to be alone. <laughs> they do like to be alone, or at least the ones that we see in the winter. Um, they might be called that just because they're kind of uh, a smaller thrush. Um, out of the thrush that I'm familiar with, you know, they're they're probably one of the smaller ones. So that's what I'm thinking. But I don't know. Maybe it is because uh, you know, in the winter time, they they are always alone, aren't they? And are they the same? How are what size are hermit thrushes? Susan wanted to know compared to Carolina wren. Uh, they're going to be bigger than a Carolina wren. I would say probably twice as twice as large, but they're going to be wow. smaller than a wood thrush. They're going to be, you know, a, a robin is a is a type of thrush, and they're going to be smaller than a robin. Um, a bluebird is also, but they're going to be bigger than a bluebird. Um, you know, if if memory serves me right. But you know, that's that's another one that you could go to allaboutbirds.org, um, and on the identification, it'll give you the exact measurements. Um, but yeah, it's 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 quite a bit bigger than a Carolina wren, even though for a thrush, it's it's on the small side. Thank you. Um... I'm going to answer this question to Jean and anybody else who may have joined us um, after we got started that this video we're recording it and it will we'll be putting it up on YouTube probably by tomorrow and we'll send you all the links so you can share it with friends and family and watch it again because there's a lot of great information in here. So thanks. All right. Thanks, Angie. Um, and here's another a picture of a caterpillar. I want you all to continue to garden for caterpillars. When you have more caterpillars, you're going to have more birds. And this was on my blueberries. Uh, we have around 16 of them, uh, plants, uh, blueberry plants. And uh, as the best that I know, it's a morning glory prominent. Um, gorgeous, gorgeous uh, caterpillar. Uh, blows the socks off of the, the adult, you know, brown moth. Um, but, you know, it, it mimics a dead edge, even with these little spiky things right here, um, you know, of, of a leaf, which is, to me, kind of incredible to think about adaptation, evolution, and, and just its ability to, to survive through, through its brilliant camouflage. Um, but some of them are, are found and they're, and they're gobbled up and uh, helps the bird survive. So garden for caterpillars. Um, so we have some, a couple Orioles, and this is the bird that, that changed my life about 10 years ago because I wasn't um, always a birder, um, but gorgeous, gorgeous bird, and uh, they, they just have some of the prettiest songs out there. So I just kind of want to highlight these just for a second. So Baltimore Oriole, and we're getting, 
gosh, it seems like, you know, every, every year over the last uh, two or three years, we're, we're having more reports of these uh, overwintering here in the Midlands and down by the coast. But, you know, some yards are getting, you know, 15 or, or, or 20 a day coming through their yards uh, down by the coast. But Baltimore Oriole right here. Isn't that just gorgeous? Now listen to the orchard oriole, okay? It, it sounds like an oriole. It sounds very similar to the, to the Baltimore Orioles, but it's gonna be a lot quicker. So they're both very, very clear. Uh, they're, they're fantastic singers, um, but this one's just a little bit, a little bit quicker. Uh, kind of almost sounds like, uh, who is it, R2-D2 or? The other one, I can't remember, but so, something from Star Wars where this one's a lot, a lot slower. Um, so great, great birds. Uh, if you haven't seen them, study the sounds and uh, you'll be able to find that bird this year. Um, these Baltimore Orioles, um, if you didn't get one this winter, uh, they'll be the, the ones that didn't overwinter in South Carolina. There, there'll be more coming up from the from Central America and other tropical areas uh, pushing through South Carolina during migration. Now, if you live around you know, the, the South Carolina mountains, you have a good chance of, of having this one um, in the summertime too. So golf course is a great place uh, for them. Um, you know, any, any kind of park with, with nice trees and edges, you might have a property, you know, that has nice trees and edges that, that might hold some Baltimore Orioles. Um, but this bird right here is the immature um, and that really threw me off uh, several years ago whenever I saw this uh, for the first time and, and didn't know what it was. Um, so it took some digging, um, but now you do have things like iNaturalist that you can take a nice picture of it and pop it on there and it'll tell you exactly what it, what it is. So you don't have to go through the frustration, but I kind of like it, it's, uh, it's fun. Um, so this is a nice immature, um, but look at, you know, look at these uh, beaks, look at these bills, nice and long, nice and long, kind of decurved, they curve down. Uh, the same, same with this Baltimore Oriole, you know, when you look at the, the warblers, look how sharp and short and pointy it is. This one kind of has a decurve uh, a bill to it, the Swainson's warbler, um, but the, the bills are a lot smaller. Let me get to the vireos, well, even the thrush. You can, you can see that they're not as sharp, uh, but you're not gonna confuse one of those. Uh, with with an with an oriole obviously um but look how stubby and short the the vireos um bills are so you know if, if you don't know what it is if you if you see this one right here but you see this kind of long and 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 pointy and and decurved bill you know there's a good chance you got an oriole there uh the females are are not going to look you know this this vibrant orange and black they're going to be more yellowish uh of the baltimore oriole so the greatest mnemonic of all time is quick, give me the beer check. You can't debate it. It is the best mnemonic. So quick, give me the beer check and let's listen to it real fast. Right? Quick, give me the beer check. So what kind of beer does the white eyed vireo like? Uh, is it A, domestic lagers, uh, B, bitter IPAs, or C, a rich and creamy Guinness? And I want y'all to answer this question and think about it. And Angie, I want you to tell me what answers are coming in, please. Okay. We have five C's, five Guinness, <laughs> six Guinness, and it's kind of evenly split. We have a few A's and a few B's in here too, so. Yeah, well, you know what? The answer, and I, I promise you, this is the one that I was gonna pick, is C, um, a rich and creamy Guinness. So good job, y'all. Um, but let's listen to that one more time. So quick, give me the beer check and hopefully y'all can hear that. Quick, give me the beer check. So sometimes you'll hear them and they just go check. Um, sometimes they just go beer check. Um, so it's it's kind of a, again, the quick give me the beer check is kind of the foundational call. Um, sometimes they'll just go absolutely bananas. You'll think it's a, a gray cat bird, you know, sitting in the thicket. Um, 
uh, and then all of a sudden a white-eyed vireo will pop out. So I just I just had one in, in my yard today. So we had the blue-headed vireo, the white-eyed vireo, and the uh, and the red-eyed vireo um, this morning. So these birds are, are coming, coming. Um, they're they're arriving. Uh, the people down in the coast and, and the coastal plain, you know, probably have this bird year round, although it's not as vocal, you know, during the winter time. Um, but if you haven't seen this bird, it's, it's a great bird. Uh, just go to thick next to, to forest, like forest edges. Uh, power lines are great uh, areas to find this bird as long as there's thick edges on where, where, the, where the open area meets the woods. I was wondering how, um, how long are these birds around in our area? Did you say how long are they around in our area? Uh, so, you know, a lot of them are, are arriving right now. Um, some started like the uh, black and white warbler, uh, blue gray gnat catcher, um, and maybe a couple others like the northern perula. Um, they, don't, they don't travel as far north uh, for the winter, so they get here uh, earlier, if that makes sense. So they, they've been here for about a month. So March, we're starting to see those birds uh, arrive. Um, but then usually by October, um, or mid-November, the birds, uh, most of the birds that we're talking about now are already gone. The bird like the hermit thrush is still here, um, but that is a winter migrant. So we, we get those in the wintertime and then they go further north to, to breed. But mo almost all of the birds that I'm talking about now come here in the springtime, uh, so right now, and then they'll leave by October, uh, no later than you know, mid-November. Every now and then you'll have a straggler, but uh, usually from about April to November. Okay, thanks. Well, that's a good question. Um, and I know we only have a, uh, about five or so more minutes. So here's some similar songs. Um, and if you have never seen a Kentucky Warbler, uh, the best place that I've found is the Palmetto Trail behind Wilson's Grocery in Pomeria, South Carolina. So it's a part of the Palmetto Trail. It's an amazing species. It has a beautiful song. Uh, it's gorgeous um, and it's in pretty steep decline. So it's, 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 it's abundant there. Um, and I don't want to give you a JKEC guarantee, but I can almost guarantee you that you'll see one um, if this year is anything like last year with the Kentucky Warblers there. So the Palmetto Trail behind Wilson's Grocery, great place to go birding. So churry, 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 churry. All right, and now let's listen to a similar song from the Carolina Wren. There's a couple options here. And that quicker song is probably going to be the one that is it gets confused with the Kentucky Warblers. I was actually uh, birding with a really good birder and he was just walking right by because he, he thought it was a Carolina wren. And I suggested let's go find, you know, what, what's making the sound and it was, you know, a Kentucky Warbler. So it sounds, they, they can sound a lot alike um, to the point where you might just kind of pass it up because you think it's a Carolina Wren. Um, but, but you can hear a slight difference there. So I'm gonna play this one more time. And maybe you can hear how somebody could get that confused with even a tufted titmouse. So it takes practice. So uh, listen to these, and they're and they're pretty similar sounds too. So you have a red-bellied woodpecker. Now you have a great crested flycatcher. All right, it gets even harder now. So a red-headed woodpecker. Sounds pretty similar, right? A little bit harsher though. Um, you know, if, you, if you've never seen a red-headed woodpecker, one of the best places to go um, is, is Lake Murray. Uh, so they have a lot of dead trees next to the shore um, and they've just gotten choked out and uh, they, the bark's fallen off and they have this nice smooth, you know, trunk um, since the bark is no longer there. And then it's a, it provides great habitat for a red-headed woodpecker. Um, or you can go to any other place like that that would have the same amount of those, those dead trees in a similar fashion. So they love having trees without any bark. Um, and uh, it's a great way to, uh, it's a great thing to remember if you've never seen one of those birds to try to find habitat like that. And then the belted kingfisher, So 
So all of these, all four of these birds have what I would say kind of this chortling, you know, call. Uh, they're kind of harsh, but I would say the, the harshest out of the four is, is this one right here. And why do I have a, an anole, you know, or an anole there? Um, it's bird food. I've seen um, bluebirds on three occasions uh, catch and consume uh, these lizards. Uh, but think about belted kingfishers. They, they not only eat um, fish, but they also eat crayfish. They, they eat reptiles. And uh, I, th I think I've read even birds on occasion. Same with the, the red-headed woodpecker and the red-bellied woodpecker. Every now and then they'll, they'll catch a fledgling. Um, so I'm, I'm sure quite a few of these lizards have become food for a few of these species up here. All right, um, it gets even harder here. So let's listen to the scarlet tanager. And this is a bird uh, that's that's so stunning. Uh, it comes all the way up here from around the Bogota, Colombia, South America area. Um, but they have very similar songs, all three of these species. But this one is, is quite burry and raspy. So let's listen to it. All right, now let's go to the summer tanager. So not as raspy, right? It's a little bit clear. All right, and then let's go to the rose-breasted grosbeak and it's very, very clear, very smooth. Um, and I know, you know there might be somebody on here that's just like, okay, I can't do this, but it, it, this isn't something that I just listened to it once and you know, you, you know now, now I know. I, you know one, of my, one of my silly jokes is uh, earbuds saved my marriage because I would listen to these sounds and songs every single night um, while I was learning all this. And then one day my wife just dropped a pair of earbuds on my chest while we were laying in bed. And she was like, uh, you need to start using these. So it takes a lot of practice. I just love it. I love seeing these birds. I love finding them and I love uh, showing them to people and helping them find them. And, uh, and learning uh, the, these sounds really, really helps me do that. So um, it takes a lot of work, um, but, it's, but it's worth it um, if, you wanna, if you wanna see these. So think about dragonflies being uh, bird food as well. They get, they get snatched up a lot, especially by this, this one right here, the great crested flycatcher. Um, and purple martins, you think about those birds, they love dragonflies. Uh, so our blue birds, um, the Eastern blue bird, and you can see that thrush pot belly right there. And hopefully y'all are seeing or hearing that sound right now at your at your bird boxes. And then the indigo bunting. So think about the phrase where, where, what, what, see it, see it. So sings in twos. And then you have something. called a blue gross beak. Um, and that's kind of just a, a jumble of, of uh, sounds there. Um, but if you go to fields, if you go to uh, power line right away, you have a good chance of, of finding that. And you got a green link spider. Watch a bluebird feed its young. You'll see them uh, use tons of spiders. And you know, for time's sake, uh, since we're over right now, I'm not gonna play all of these. These are sounds that are pretty common. Uh, drink your tea for the Eastern Towhee. Um, here's all sorts of caterpillars that, that we found um, at a visit to South Carolina Botanical Garden when we were out there birding. Bird food, y'all, so, so plant for caterpillars. But I do want y'all to, to listen to these. Um, I heard my first one last night when I went out to the truck to get something. Uh, so Chuck Will's Widow, and uh, I don't have a picture of it because you're probably not gonna see it, but you'll probably hear it um, if, you, if, you, if you live near a forest. Uh, they're, they're, it's a great sound to hear. Reminds me of growing up on Lake Murray. And then finally, the Eastern Screech Owl. So they, they call that a whinny, um, you know, for, for good reason. So, and, and, you know, I heard that a few weeks ago whenever we went camping on, on Lake Murray not too long ago. Yes, ma'am. 
Oh, hi. <laughs> I was just checking in. We don't really have, um, I, let me say it. Rosemary is report, reporting that um, she's hearing white eyed vireos now in her neighborhood. And Bradley up in Lake Kiwi said that uh, he has a lot of red headed woodpeckers going um, nice. sightings. Um, and I, if, if you're ready to wrap up, I, I think we can um, keep the chat box open for a little bit longer. Um, mm -hmm. If anybody has any last minute questions, um, and again, if you think of something afterwards, please just feel free to um, email us. And um, again, we're going to send you out an email with um, some links of all the stuff we talked about today and a link to the video so you can watch it again. Um, probably within, you know, by tomorrow, we should have that out to all of you. Um, and thank you for joining us. Uh, Kathy wants to know if you ever have done a class just on owls. Uh, I haven't. You know, we we have a we have a handful of owls here, and uh, maybe maybe at some point we will. Uh, maybe when we get closer to the fall time, um, that's something that we can do. You know, just have a nice small, um, short shorter class for owls. But uh, you know, we have them. Um, you know, on on my property in Chapin, we've we've gotten the the barred and the the great horned owls and and the screech owls. You know, actually um, breeding in in some boxes. That we have out for them so we we do have a, a nice variety of owls um so maybe we have one on the on the horizon for you but real, real fast again the the resources that we have here uh learn the mnemonics practice um all about birds.org is a fantastic place to to start um even even you know i i still use it um it's, it's a great website uh, eBird is fantastic. You'll find more birds if you know where they are, right? And you can use eBird for that. Um, sit and wait for the birds to come to you. You know, sit down for 30 minutes, sit down for an hour even, uh, bring you a little snack and the birds will get used to you. The birds will kind of, you know, feed in this um, cyclical manner and, and they'll come to you at some point. Um, and again, pay attention to the habitat you're in. And if you want to see more birds on your property, do what this fella did. Um, he took all the invasive or, or foreign species out um, and he planted all, well, almost all around 70, I think 70 to 80% native. And his, his property is just uh, uh, teeming with life. It's, it's really a treat to, to visit it. So uh, plant more natives on your property. Um, if you have a, have a uh, option of planting turf grass or something like this, um, consider something like this, you know, consider planning for wildlife and not just, you know, the aesthetics that the, the turf grass gives you, the, the sense of, you know, cleanliness that, that it gives you. You know, go, go for that wild look and support wildlife. You'll have more praying mantis. You'll have more barking tree frogs. You'll have more uh, cute kids holding rough green snakes. And that's my son right there. <laughs> Um, and remember all those, that's, that's all bird food. This is bird food. That's bird food. And this snake right here is bird food. And, uh, you know, I always have to throw in this, this quote because I love it. So in the end, we'll conserve only what we love. We'll love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. So if you like this, um, and you like the idea of us getting in front of more people and getting them connected to nature, please donate since we're nonprofit, uh, the more money we have coming in, um, the more people we get to reach. And uh, hopefully the more people re we reach, um, the more stewards of, of, of planet Earth we have. Um, so uh, just, just a little bit about us. We've put up 370 uh, prothonotary warbler boxes in the last two years. Um, we love getting the kids out, although we love getting adults out too. Um, school presentations, though we're not getting in schools right now, we're doing plenty through Zoom and then litter cleanups. Um, so that's where your money goes to. So if you can um, donate, please do so. And so we can continue reaching more people in the in the state of South Carolina and New Jersey and Louisiana. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And um, on our website, we also have a Columbia Spring Birding Day. If you're in the area or want to travel in uh, and arrive here by 7 a.m., uh, Jay will be, uh, who's joining you on that one? Do you have someone with you? We're going to go to the Horseshoe in downtown Columbia, and then we're going to go to uh, the Robert Mills House, another historic area. 
uh, and bird there. And then we're going to end at the USC Arboretum. So, you know, this the, the green areas in Columbia are going to act as funnels and these migratory birds uh, should come to them. We should have some really neat birds right in downtown Columbia. And then, you know, maybe you can go out and uh, have a have a have a good drink and, and some lunch afterwards. But uh, we're going to be right downtown Columbia birding, uh, you know, in that in that great city. It's on May 7th, so if you want to look into that again, it's on the website, and we'll, I'll add that link to the email as well. Yeah. Um, and thank you again for everybody for joining us. We, I think I enjoyed this as much as everybody else, Jay. Thank you. Well, good. You had some good questions. Uh, I, <laughs> are there any more questions? Or There was one about um, someone wanted to know, Greg wanted to know if noise from lawn equipment is harmful to the hearing of bird species, especially those in nesting boxes. Any I, ideas on that? I don't know if it's harmful to their hearing, but I do know that noise pollution affects their ability to breed. So if I am trying to sing and reach, you know, those birds, the noise pollution can drown out my, my song. So there's actually been studies that have shown that birds in cities sing louder than birds, you know, out in the country because they have to kind of rise above all that noise. Yeah. Um, I know with COVID, with uh, the reduction of travel and noise and, you know, from, from all the equipment or the cars, um, I think they did see a reduction in the volume of city, the, the songs of city birds last year, uh, which I think is pretty, pretty interesting. Um, so that's, that's about as close as I can get to your, to answering your question. Well, the last one we have is from Christine and she wants to know if we have to chop nuts for breeding season. No, what I would say is plant more native plants for breeding season. Um, the, the babies don't need the, the seeds or nuts. They need caterpillars. They need spiders. They need, um, uh, other insects, whatever those insects may be. Uh, there's, there's protein, there's carotenoids in those, in those bugs uh, or those insects. Um, there's all sorts of nutrition and fat that they need. They don't, they don't really need the seeds. Uh, you, you think about 96 or 97 percent of all the terrestrial birds that we have, ones that aren't, you know, over the ocean, um, they, they eat insects. Um, uh, a, a chickadee um, uh, couple will feed their uh, chicks around five to six thousand caterpillars um, before they fledge. So think about that. Um, they, they don't feed them seeds. Uh, they don't feed them nuts. They feed them insects. So what I want you to do is plant more plants that are going to support more insects. Now you can mm -hmm. chop you can chop them up all, all day long and, and I would save that for the winter time and you'll probably have some really nice birds coming to it. But right now they don't need that. They need insects. And are hanging plants just as effective as plants that we put in the ground? Uh, as long as they're native, yeah. Hanging plants are probably right. going to have, you know, you're probably going to have some, some birds as long as, you know, it has a roof over it. You're probably going to have some birds finding it and, and breeding in it. But uh, yeah, as long as they're native, it doesn't matter where they are. The butterflies and moths are going to find it to lay their eggs or, you know, possibly find it to lay their eggs on. And then, uh, then all of a sudden you have caterpillars. Yeah, and we have links to um, native plants on our website as well in the habitat section if you're interested in, in um, looking to uh, plant some of those natives and source some of those seeds. So please go on the website and check that there. And thanks again, Jay. This was yeah. great. This is great. Well, thank you. thank you everybody for joining us. All right, guys, y'all have a great day. Bye.